Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is Tracy from the FIRST Events team. Uh, just a few very quick reminders before we get started. All attendees are muted. Uh, if you are using the event app, we encourage you to check in to the session, update your activities, um, and be sure to complete the session survey at the end. If you are having any app trouble and an Android user, please send us an email at events at first.org and we'll try to see if we can help you out. Um, just a reminder, the session is TLP white and is being recorded. Recordings will be available within 24 hours via the app and the desktop site. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to your session moderator uh, for this session, Dr. Serge Droz. Serge. Okay, thank you, Tracy. And welcome everybody. Um, Tracy said it, my name is Serge Droz and I'll moderate this session and a uh, couple of just tiny things before we start, uh, please add your questions and we hope there's lots of questions of uh, to the Q&A section of the of Zoom and I'll, I'll then process them as they come in at the end in the Q&A period and uh, having said that let's go ahead with Martin Ayan the chief or head of research of mnemonics talking about lessons learned from building a threat intelligence platform. Uh, I'm eager to hear this uh, building one myself right now. So without further ado, Martin. Thank you. Um, for the past three years, we've been busy building a threat intelligence platform uh, called ACT, A-C-T. And that's tailored for analysis and automation. And during that work, we made observations on the state of the art in threat intelligence platforms, uh, on threat sharing and some general observations on the field of threat intelligence. Uh, we made mistakes. Uh, we found some issues, both obvious and maybe some more subtle. And we tried to find solutions that work in the real world. So this presentation is about all the lessons we learned on the way. Uh, and hopefully some of those lessons can be useful to the rest of the community. So just a quick agenda. Um, I'll very briefly introduce threat intelligence. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why we built a threat intelligence platform and what we did. And then the main part will be the lessons learned. And I'll round off with a call to arms and a little bit about the road ahead, what we're going to do in the future. But first off, what is threat intelligence? And why did we build this app platform? Now, threat intelligence is something to help you correctly assess risk and to help you defend against real and relevant threats rather than imaginary ones. There are multiple different definitions of threat intelligence. They either say that it's knowledge of threats or information about threats. The key difference there is that knowledge implies understanding. And a core component of understanding is being able to identify causes and effects. And as security professionals, we primarily observe effects. We see traces of activity in log files, in network traffic, on endpoints. And then we try to reason about that to figure out what caused these traces. What are the likely causes? So we went for a definition of threat intelligence as knowledge. And we built the Act platform to store our knowledge of threats to try to make it more useful. Being able to efficiently find prior knowledge about the threat and relate that to what you're observing here and now is useful. It can help you to get more context and it can help you make the right decisions. Uh, making it useful also means to automate where possible so you don't waste time doing repetitive manual work. On this path or quest to automate, we found a wide range of issues with threat intelligence standards, with terminology, and with information sources. And threat intelligence is like, it's kind of like trying to lay a puzzle with missing pieces, uncertain pieces, wrong pieces, and even changing pieces. So a threat intelligence platform that takes all of that into account can help you understand and explain what you're observing here and now actually means, as well as how certain you can be about your conclusions. So the first thing we did was to 
investigate all of the available threat intelligence platform and try to figure out if they could meet our requirements. We came to the conclusion that they couldn't uh, because at a very high level, our goal was we needed a platform that would help us to collect and organize our knowledge of threats to facilitate analysis and sharing and to make it easy to retrieve that knowledge when we needed it. We spent way too much time on manual processing, co copy pasting information between systems. And a lot of our knowledge was in unstructured form, like human readable threat reports. And that made it difficult and time consuming to figure out if we had relevant knowledge that could help us decide how to handle a security incident or alert. And to break it down a bit, uh, goal number one was to build a knowledge base. We wanted a one-stop shop for our knowledge of threats, but we didn't want to store all of the information there. We store pointers to other systems with more details, but this platform should give us the overview, how things are connected. We wanted to be able to store knowledge, not just information. And that means that semantics matter. We need to have meaningful relations. We wanted to be able to retrieve that knowledge, uh, define and understand it, and relate it to what we're observing here and now. And finally, we wanted to be able to quantify uncertainty. That means managing trust, confidence, and also missing information. How certain can you be that this claim is actually true? Second goal was semi-automation. We wanted, as far as possible, to automate the collection of threat intelligence. And that also means to be able to extract structured data and information from human-readable unstructured text, because a lot of the relevant information is only available as unstructured information. We wanted to automate enrichment, and that's basically the process of converting data to information. We wanted to automate analysis to be able to gain new knowledge from what we already knew, countermeasures to mitigate the threats that we discovered, and finally, lossless information sharing. We want to be able to share information without losing it on the way, and that's a big problem with most threat sharing today. And finally, we needed strict access control. We wanted role-based access control to get access management scalable, but we also needed explicit access control because in threat intelligence, a fairly common use case is I want to share this piece of information with that individual and no one else. We needed support for multi-tenancy. That means multiple different information owners in the same platform instance. And finally, granular access controls. We needed to be able to control access to every single piece of information in the platform. So that was a short intro. Uh, lesson number one is it's all about relations. Because the key difference between data and information is that information tells you how data points are related to each other. And as an example, an IP address is a data point. And by itself, it's pretty worthless from a threat intelligence viewpoint. The interesting information is how is this IP address related to other data points? Like, have we seen files downloaded from it? Were those files malicious? Uh, do they belong to a specific malware family? Which organization owns this IP address? Uh, which domain names have we solved to? So a graph is a convenient and useful model for describing relations. And therefore, we implemented the ACT platform as a graph database. That means that it also supports graph queries, automated analysis by traversing the graph. So all of these data points or observables are nodes in the graph, whereas the useful information are represented as edges relating to objects or object properties. Objects are unique, so all the information we've collected on, for example, an IP address, are connected to the same object. So if you retrieve that object and all the relations, you get all the information we have on it. And just a point, note that a graph view is not the same as a graph database, because you can 
display any kind of data, even a flat text file, as a graph, but you cannot use graph queries unless you have a graph database. So we designed a low-level data model to support this. And the data model consists of objects that are global, unique by value. And this is an example. It's an IP address that has object type IPv4 and value 127001. And that's all information there is on this object. It's only the type and the value. And it's unique by the type value combination. All the interesting information is stored as facts. And facts can be connected to a single object like this. Here's a fact of type category that has the value loopback. It tells you that this IP address has category loopback. Or they can connect two objects. And that's a relation or an edge in the graph. This fact tells you that the fully qualified domain name foo.com resolves to IPv4 address 12701. The facts in the data model are immutable. That means they cannot be modified or deleted once they're added to the platform. If you do realize that it's wrong, you can retract it. That's basically adding a new fact saying that this was wrong by retracting. And every fact is timestamped. And the combination of immutability and timestamps gives you the ability to re rewind time. So if you made a decision three months ago and you're wondering what kind of information did I have then, you can just rewind time by three months and you can see exactly what kind of information you have. Uh, Every fact has an owner. That's important for multi-tenancy. Every single fact supports role-based and explicit access control. And every fact can be backed by evidence and comments. And finally, every fact has an origin or source. And every source has a trust rating, which you set yourself. It's a value between 0 and 1, how much you trust the source. So if you have 100% trust in the source, then the value is 1. And every fact supports confidence. So if the source says, I'm 100% confident that this is correct, then the confidence score will be 1. Finally, the product of those two gives you a certainty. So every fact stores trust, confidence, and certainty. In order to implement this, um, we created the schema or ontology where we define the object types and the fact types. and which objects each fact type could connect. And this is available on the URL at the bottom of the slide. Um, and this is basic, this is just a subset of the, the ontology, but the goal here was to represent knowledge and to facilitate more advanced analysis techniques, traversals, and to allow us to build bridges between technical, tactical, operational, and strategic threat intelligence. I'll get back to that bridge building in a short while. But the next lesson learned was uh, pivots can be very useful. You can pivot on objects. And what that does is to let you find related information and give you more context. Uh, the canonical example or a simple example of pivoting is from DNS or passive DNS. You start with a domain name, you find all of the IP addresses that it has resolved to. And then you find all other domain names that are resolved to those IP addresses. And then you can keep going like that. Uh, when you do that, you quickly run into issues because of sinkholes, uh, domain parking, shared hosting, uh, which can very quickly lead you astray. So for that kind of pivoting, you need to classify and you need to label the addresses so that you can filter them out during a graph traversal. But that's a very, very simple example. One more interesting one is, um, you can create uncommon pivot points. This is an example from URLs. Uh, given a URL, we split it. So you have the host or FQDN or IP address as a separate object. You have the path as a separate object. And you have the query parameters as a separate object. And that proved useful when we were tracking phishing campaigns, because some of these campaigns would reuse their phishing kits. So for every spam run, they would change the domain name, they would change the path, but they would reuse the query parameter. So by pivoting on that, we could track them over time. And the lesson learned there is try to identify new pivot points and exploit them. 
And if you find a pivot point in a graph representation, that should be an object because you need objects to be able to pivot in a graph traversal. Another observation that we made early on was that we built a threat graph, and that graph ended up being a series of islands or subgraphs that were not connected. So we had lots of small graphs here and there, and we wanted to be able to connect them. And a simple solution to that was enrichment. So you see an IP address, do a lookup in passive DNS to find all the domains that are resolved to it, and then you add that information to the graph. And we kept adding more enrichment sources, and the graph gradually became more and more interesting connected and we could find new connections between clusters of information that initially were separate. Well, that's also very simple. One more uh, maybe interesting or advanced solution was using classifiers to be able to bridge technical, tactical, operational, and strategic threat intelligence. Uh, this is an example of using virus total to bridge technical indicators to tactical information in MitreTAC. So consider this SHA-256 sum. It represents a file which is on virus token. And to the left, you see one of the antivirus signatures that are triggered on this file, Trojan Downloader Win32 slash Zebrazy. And on the right, you see the software entry in MitreTAC for Zebrazy. So from virus total, when we receive a file hash, we enrich it using virus token. So we look it up and we find that this signature is triggered. We extract the malware family name, Zebrazy, and we lowercase it to normalize it. So we end up with an object of type tool value Zebrazy. Previously, we've imported MitreTAC, which has a software entry for Zebrazy. We do the same thing there, lowercase it, and create a tool object with the value Zebrazy. Now, since objects are unique by value, then these two are the same object. And that actually links the information from virus total to the information from attack automatically. So antivirus engines on virus total are classifiers. It's also possible to find other classifiers, and that can be incredibly useful because it lets you build bridges between the different categories of threat intelligence. You can also go from tactical to strategic, for instance, and that gives you a much more comprehensive, comprehensive context on what you're observing here now. So this is what it looks like in the ACT threat graph. In the bottom there, you have the, the file hash, which is classified as Zebrazy, and then there's a link to the threat actor APT28 with all of the aliases. So this works very well as long as you use the same name for things. But in reality, there are multiple names for the same malware family, and there are multiple names for the same threat actor, and that creates problems for this bridge building. So we needed a solution for that. How do we handle many different names? So the solution is obvious, and it's like everyone does, basically. You use aliases. So in this case, Sophacy is an alias for APT28. Now, the more subtle thing here is that we started out selecting a canonical name for each threat actor and each malware family. And then we connected all of the information to that name. So if we got, we selected APT28 as our canonical name for this threat actor. If we got information about Sophacy, we would connect that to the APT28 object. The same thing if we get the information about Fancy Bear, we would also connect it to APT28. And then a while later, we realized that that was probably one of the biggest mistakes we did because information could be wrong. So if you then at some point in the future realize that Sophacy is not actually an alias for APT28, then you have a huge mess to clean up if you connected all the information to APT28. So the way we solved it was only attach information to the name given from the source, not to a canonical name. So if we receive information about Sophacy, we attach it to the Sophacy object. Receive information about Sednit, we attach it to the Sednit object. Then, if at some point you realize an alias is wrong, all you need to do is to retract that single alias and all the rest of your information is still correct. Now, 
when we do the graph analytics, we solve this by traversing all aliases whenever we hit an object that supports aliases. So if we do a graph traversal and we hit a threat actor object, before we do anything more, we find all of the aliases and collect all of the threat actor objects that are aliases for the object you found. And then you continue the graph traversal from the set of threat actor objects rather than from the single threat actor object. And in that way, the aliases act as an intermediary bridge, which also lets you correlate information from different sources that might use different canonical names for the same threat actor. Uh, this work on bridge building and aliases actually uncovered a range of data and information quality issues in important sources of threat intelligence. Uh, so the first one is about naming things, which is hard. And it's especially hard when you want to do automated processing and analysis of information from multiple different sources. One very useful tool to help you do that is vocabularies. Um, this is an example from STIX 2.0, the industry sector vocabulary. Um, this vocabulary is not perfect, like where do you place a law firm, but it's useful because it lets you correlate and pivot on information from different sources. So if everyone uses this vocabulary, we know that if it's something targeting the healthcare industry, then it will be called healthcare. And given our data model, that means all of the information will be connected to the same sector object. So one example, this is a really great resource from TICERT, the threat group cards. And if you're not using this, I suggest you try, uh, try it out. They have collected information on threat actors, aliases, malware families. Um, operations or campaigns, um, sectors that they target, and geographical areas that they target. Now, the sectors there, we, initially it looked like they were using the sticks vocabulary, but then when we went into more detail, we would find things like political dissidents and Forbes sector, or large domestic companies and multinational corporation branches sector, or electronics and journalists sector. So it's a really great resource, but it could be even better if they chose the vocabulary and stuck to it, because then it would be easier to process. Next lesson was centralized curation versus community efforts. Uh, in the early project stages, we used both MicroAttack and MISP Galaxy as sources for malware family and threat actor aliases. But we found so many quality issues, like several two different threat actors with the alias APT17 in Miss Galaxy that at some point we stopped using it because it was adding wrong information to our knowledge base. Uh, one reason for that might be that attack has a very, very strict curation and requires uh, references for all information. And that might not be possible to achieve with a community effort where you don't have centralized curation of the information. So, Automated consumption of threat intelligence is hard. And that indicates to us that this using these techniques to automatically enrich and build bridges is not widely used. And we've been trying to figure out why, but one of the reasons might be that there's a general consensus in the threat intel community that we don't share enough threat intelligence. Thus, we must remove the barriers to sharing. Thus, the standards must be flexible. It must be easy to share. The problem with that is if you make it easy to share, you make it harder to consume. Because if you want to make it easy to consume this automatically, you need to be strict. You need to represent information in the same way every time. And for every piece of threat information produced, it might be consumed hundreds or thousands of times. So making it difficult to consume, to make it easier to produce is not scalable or efficient. Finally, trust and confidence. Um, relations in threat intelligence are not binary. 
They may, might be uncertain, wrong, or missing. So to manage uncertainty, as I mentioned, we implemented a trust score for information sources, a confidence score for each relation, and then a certainty score, which is the product. And the key observation there was that almost none of the sources that we imported had any kind of confidence scores in a machine-readable format. And antivirus engines, such as their classifiers, they could have provided the confidence score, but they don't. So that leaves us with guessing. How certain is this AV engine that this is actually that malware family? We don't know. Oh, could you come to a close end or maybe- I'm almost, yeah, yeah, I'm almost there. So I just hope I don't come across as arrogant or bitter or difficult or anything. Uh, I think that we can do this better. I think that the necessary changes are manageable and that the results are valuable because given the ad platform, you can give it an IP address, you can get using a graph query, malware family names, command and control infrastructure, downloads, threat actors, techniques, incident signatures, reports that mention it. And the way to achieve that is to share information as triplets. Source object, relation, destination. Think relations when you share information. Don't think data. And finally, the road ahead. We are also participating in a new project called Socrates, where we develop a security automation and decision support platform for uh, SOCs and incident responders. And as part of that, we're developing the ACT platform with a focus on tactical threat intelligence, and we're trying to be able to automatically generate adversary emulation plans. And currently, we're sequencing attack techniques by defining preconditions, postconditions, so you can create attack chains automatically. That project has a stakeholder group. We're looking for interested parties that would like to uh, participate in the stakeholder group. So, if you want, if if you think that sounds interesting, just have a look at the website, and we also have the deliverables there. And finally, the ACT platform is open source, it's on GitHub, it's ISC license, and we also have a public AWS instance read-only with only open source intelligence, if you just want to test it. That's it for me. Okay, thank you. thank you, Martin. Um, there are three questions, or rather one comment, it seems, and, and actually now three questions. So first one is from uh, Utpendra Singh, Facts should also be associated with a TTL, time to live. Yes, you can. I, I mean, we, we don't have native support for it in the data model, uh, but you do have a timestamp. You know when that information was added and you can handle TTL on the outside. So if you wanna export information to a reputation system or to, to a firewall, uh, that could be handled on the outside of the platform because you have all the information you need. Okay, thanks. Then the next question is from Andrew Cormack. Uh, does granular access control on individual facts risk A, cutting graph, or conversely, B, allowing unintended access interferences across around a cut? It feels quite hard to foresee the effect of granting or refusing access. You grant or refuse access to each fact separately. So yes, in the case, you might cut the graph if you don't have, I mean, if you don't have access to that single fact with bridges to subgraphs, then you will see it as two separate subgraphs. Okay, then the next question is, thanks. The next question is by Patrick Forsberg. How do you solve name clashes? If, for instance, it turns out that virus total win 32 Saber C isn't the same as the attack version we don't have a so i don't think there's a solution for that basically if you if you use the exact same name then we don't have a solution for it now okay would maybe be adding adding the source to the name or something kind of the the, the, uh, the facts have a source so anything connected to that the object is unique by name but anything connected to the object will also have a source. Okay. So if ZBC has an alias to another tool object, then that might come from my to attack and attack will be the source or the origin for that fact. Whereas if you have a sample classified as ZBC, that has another origin, which could be virus talking. 
So they're di distinguishable, but uh, we don't natively uh, handle that uh, name collision, no. Okay, thanks. Then the next is by Philip Sorchkovsky. Why did you decide on confidence scores from feed sources rather than building your own score engine based on the threat data context? Because our own evaluation is, um, uh, they're not mutually exclusive, first off. Uh, but our, our own evaluation is for each source, we assign a trust score. How much do we trust this source? And then we support that the source can set the confidence score for every fact that we receive. Okay. And finally, we compute the certainty based on that. But um, we could have analysis workers that add new information and set a different confidence score given the context. So you analyze the not, not each single fact, but you analyze this in context with all the other information you have. But the way you would do that is create new facts. You wouldn't modify what's in there already. That's kind of falsifying history, but you would create new facts. Okay, thanks a lot. Then Ahmed Musal asks, can you put some light on ICS slash OT SCADA specific threat Intel sources? Well, we're going to at least import uh, attack for ICS. Uh, but I mean, the Threat Intel platform is not exclusively for enterprise networks or for ICS networks. This, uh, we haven't done the data modeling for ICS specific things, but that's definitely something we're looking into in the future. OK. So. There seems to be a lot of potential. Um, thanks a lot again, Martin, for presenting this. As usual, once the questions get going, then the things become interesting. Sadly, the time is over and we move on to the next session. Uh, so thanks to the audience for staying with us. Thanks again, Martin, to present in this virtual conference. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye.